You ever seen a ghost? Been abducted? Heard your name whispered from the other room when you're all alone? No, you say? Me either. But if you're like me, you're still fascinated by the paranormal. It seems everyone else has had an experience, and you want to believe it all. So why doesn't it happen to us? What does it all mean? How does it work? Is any of it real? Welcome to Paranorm Girl, a show that will attempt to answer these questions by taking the paranormal completely apart in search of proof. I'm not a blind believer, nor a hardened skeptic. I'm just looking for answers and willing to accept what I find. Before we begin today, be forewarned. Warning number one. In the first episode, I mentioned we may have to stick our toes a teensy-weensy bit into the murky waters of conspiracy land at some point. That point has arrived. So, if you want to remain more on the paranormal side of my show and these lessons, you know, uh, skip this one. See you back here in two weeks. Warning number dos. What I am covering today is a very big conversation. The more you know, the more questions you have, the more rabbit holes you're led down, the more you realize how much you don't know. So, while I cannot cover absolutely everything in this one because it's quite impossible to do so, I promise you that I have done my very best to compile the most pertinent information for this episode, and it is my hope for you guys listening that this is a jumping off point for you and the opener to the bigger conversation that needs to be had. With that said, here we go. So what the hell is causing the Mandela Effect, man? It's fairly impossible to get through any amount of Mandela Effect research without running into numerous ideas, conspiracies, science sounding theories, and some more metaphysical reasons as to what is causing all of this. Why, for so many, have things changed? This conversation would not be complete without speaking at length about CERN. A lot of fingers get pointed at these guys, so let's just start there. CERN itself is a science and research facility straddling the border between France and Switzerland. In their mission statement, they state that their work helps to uncover what the universe is made of and how it works. They champion and provide a range of particle accelerator facilities, perform world-class research in fundamental physics, and claim to push the frontiers of science and technology for the benefit of all. Their goals include making new scientific discoveries, innovating in technology, supporting diversity and bringing nations together, inspiration and education. Sounds pretty straightforward, yes? You agree? So, what's the problem? What's with all of the finger pointing? The major event of concern surrounding CERN and why they teeter on the cusp of so many ME theory discussions took place on September 10th, 2008, when they turned on the Large Hadron Collider. Referred to as a super collider, it is the largest particle accelerator and collider on the planet, with a circumference spanning 27 kilometers. For my fellow Americans, that is almost 17 miles all the way around. The very basic description of what this thing does is this. It uses electromagnetic fields to accelerate and steer particles and radio frequency and magnets to boost the energy of these particles in order to increase the power and speed of them as they go round and round the accelerator loop. And once they have reached nearly close to the speed of light, they collide them into some target, such as another particle. Massive subparticles, such as the Higgs boson, are created and then studied after this collision occurs, which allows the scientists to examine the world of the infinitely small and increase our understanding of matter and even the origins of the universe. This thing and what these scientists do here is really important to understand if you are operating under the widely held belief that the universe was created out of the Big Bang, as this smashing of particles creates matter in the form of new particles, the most massive of which existed in the early moments of the universe. Due to the recreation of this universe birthing event and these scientists quote unquote playing God, some ME enthusiasts theorize that these experiments caused us to either jump timelines or other timelines to have merged with our own. 
A much darker theory is that Adam's smashing activities in 2012 and 2013 in the LHC actually produced a mini black hole in the scientists' quest to search for that god particle, despite the known risk of doing so. Some speculate that this did indeed happen, and though this is not the way that black holes work as far as I understand it, that it immediately sucked our universe, reality and all, human consciousness and all, into it, transferring us into a parallel timeline onto an alternate Earth that is similar but not quite identical to our original Earth and timeline. No one would remember this happening, no one would remember the previous reality as being separate from this one, but some might notice those changes we refer to as Mandela effects. Some might, others would not, because at that point, we would be talking about the idea that everyone on the planet right now is either from the previous timeline or this one. We, uh, we walking around with a bunch of strangers, y'all. Eileen Colts argues this idea, stating that if that were true, all of the differences in matter would have happened all at once and not still be occurring. There also could be none of these flip-flops of Mandela effects that we are seeing. She concludes that for the very reason that new Emmys appear every day and matter seems to be switching back and forth constantly, that we can discount the we all suddenly died in 2012 theory. It's an interesting theory, talked a lot about on a bunch of forums, but I actually agree with her logic here. As of this moment and this information at hand, I can't jump on board with this whole black hole merging two timelines, two realities one, as it, it's, it's never just one side or the other with the Mandela effect. Yes, for the most part, you either remember Berenstein or you remember Berenstain. But what about all of the other Emmys out there that are numerous variations and alternate memories? Chick-fil-A, remember? There were three variations on that one. Would that mean we are dealing with three merged timelines? Or how about the buffet of dates surrounding Nelson Mandela's death? I've come across different actual dates, different times of year, different years. Would we then be accepting that there were an infinite number of parallel timelines that merged after being sucked into that black hole? It's a fascinating theory. Does it hold any water? Mm, eh. I do only find it interesting, though, uh, the timing. This thing was turned on in 2008, and it was only a few years later that the bulk of people with alternate memories started to take notice of them. It doesn't explain, though, even though they were far fewer and far between, or, or perhaps just not able to publicly talk about Emmy in the capacity that we gained around that time, the people who had already noticed changes previously to the LHC being turned on. So in general, what are some other reasons people are so afraid of what the scientists are doing at CERN? Again, the LHC is the largest collider in the world. It is a one-of-a-kind facility with the capability to produce highly energetic collisions and create new matter in the form of new particles from these impacts. But what are the consequences of producing these new particles? Are we certain of the repercussions? The answer is no. No, we are not. Even though the scientists claim it to be safe, the worry is that they can't be 100% certain, as any new experiment they hold, any new particle they create, has never been done before. Are we playing with fire? Or this one. The LHC has the ability to create antimatter, which annihilates its equal in regular matter when it comes into contact with it. Is, uh, is that not a concerning thought? Am I crazy here? Anyway. That is CERN and their LHC. Second possible cause we are going to talk about is the simulation theory. So I just watched a really great film. It's available on Amazon Prime right now. If ME really dazzles and delights you and you are of the mind that it is one of the side effects of our existing in a simulation, watch this film. It's called The Mandela Effect, duh, and stars Charlie Hoffheimer, Alexa Palladino, and Robin Lord Taylor. I loved him in Gotham. So it's about this husband who has a background in programming and his wife, and they lose their daughter at the beginning of the film after she drowns. Afterward, the husband all of a sudden starts noticing these small changes, the Mandela effects, like the Bernstein Bears that he used to read to his kid, like the Monopoly guy and his uh, monocle on the board game that he and his family used to play together before the kid's death. He 
gets a bit fixated on it and becomes convinced via help from a professor in theoretical physics that the world indeed is a simulation and that the Mandela effects he's noticing are all glitches in the program. The result of the sim tinkering with the code, making updates, that that kind of thing. And he begins to believe that if, if he can just reprogram it somewhat, he can get his daughter back. It only got a 20% on Rotten Tomatoes, which should not affect your interest in watching it. I don't quite understand that rating unless it's people like we've talked about prior who get upset when hearing or learning about M.E. Or, as I can clearly see from some of the reviews, it's people who completely miss the point of the film altogether. In short, though, I liked it. Though I cannot claim to understand most of the computer or programming jargon they spout off throughout the film, I still found and find it fascinating to think about the world through this simulation lens. And the more you think about it, the more it seems conceivable. Uh, It could explain so many things that just don't add up, right? It could explain the paranormal, ghosts, deja vu, even Mandela effects. These could be viruses or glitches, the sim trying to correct itself continuously. Deep stuff, man. Um, It could also account for people in land masses that simply vanish. Maybe that is code that gets removed or written out of the program, which can also explain how some residue can still exist, while for the most part, most everything else that would support the memory someone is having is suddenly not the way that they remember, that it's because some of the codes for those items were more conducive to the program-wide wipe, and some of those items photos of someone on their social media being tagged at the Statue of Liberty on Ellis Island, but it's missing, perhaps, uh, old journal entries. Maybe their code was too corrupted and unable to process that update. This this is all getting a, li- a bit deep, even for me, so let's pull it back here. Uh, to wrap up this theory, here are some quotes on it from people much smarter than I am. Elon Musk said on the Joe Rogan podcast, If you assume any rate of improvement at all, games will eventually be indistinguishable from reality. We're most likely in a simulation. Neil deGrasse Tyson stated in an email to NBC News that there were better than 50-50 odds that the simulation hypothesis is correct. He said, I wish I could summon a strong argument against it, but I can find none. Unsure, but he may have been referring to a new study analyzing the odds of us living in a base reality versus a simulated one that demonstrates if humans were to ever develop the ability to simulate conscious beings, the chances would overwhelmingly tilt in favor of us two being virtual denizens inside someone else's computer. If you didn't already have severe anxiety before this, welcome to the club. I can go on and on and on on about the simulation hypothesis, the simulation argument created by Nick Bostrom. But what I will do, since we are running out of time already, and I'm only two causes in, um, I will include some awesome links below for your personal education. Check them out. Special shout out to Rob Shelsky in this episode. A lot of what I said about CERN comes from him. And in addition, he has an incredible list of causes in his book that I mentioned before called Shattered Reality. Check that out as well. Cause number three I'm including is something that Eileen Coltz talks about. I mentioned previously I was going to talk a little bit more about it. And it has to do with the hive mind, mass consciousness. And if you are already an aware person and in the know of the current more spiritual ideas floating around out there today, such as law of attraction, grabavoy numbers, the global consciousness project, which works to demonstrate that massive human emotions on a grand scale, massive focusing of thought on a grand scale can actually affect the resulting data. Uh, The noted powerful effect that prayer can have, positive thinking can have, and marry that with the scientific ideas of superposition demonstrated by the double slit experiment where a quantum system can exist in all possible states before a measurement of some sort is applied, collapsing the system into one singular state, or the idea of retrocausality, which is where cause and effect can be reversed, i.e., not only is it things we do in the past that cause change in the future, but things we do in the present or future actually has an effect on the causing event in the past, and the idea of quantum entanglement, which plays a part in superposition, also demonstrated by the double-slit experiment, 
It's a phenomenon observed at the quantum scale where entangled particles stay connected, even when physically separated, so that the actions performed on one of the particles affects the other, no matter the distance between the two. For example, if the spin of one is reversed, the other will change its spin at the very instant of reversal, whether it's two feet apart or two light years apart. If you aren't drowning in a pool of your own brain goo right now and have heard about or understood any of what I have just said, then you can probably accept this third cause as conceivable. Ms. Colts does a much better job than I'm about to explaining how she arrived at the idea that we and our focus is actually contributing to the changes we are seeing, but trying to keep it as simple as uh, possible as I can right now. Due to the planetary, solar, and cosmic, energetic, and magnetic shifts that are occurring, add in the ideas of superposition, retrocausality, and entanglement as a contributing factor for how matter has and is created and edited, which is then influenced by the stronger waves of mass human consciousness, matter then may flow into states of material change. To sum it up, before my brain melts, I'm going to quote this next bit directly from her section of Mandela Effect, Friend or Foe. The Mandela Effect may very well be showing us it is literally mind over matter. I believe the collective subconscious human mind creates and edits matter constantly around us, and the natural energetic changes to our planet, solar system, and galaxy is changing our awareness of this process. So now we can actually see the process of creating and editing matter with our thoughts and feelings. Okay, this is a rough one. Uh, very briefly, thank dog. I'm going to list the other causes I've come across in the research for this one before we move on to the final cause that I distinctly want to talk about. Other contenders include time travel, quantum computers, quantum immortality, vibratory universe, alien overlords, None of this is real, and nothing actually exists. That's a fun one. Artificial intelligence. This is all but a dream. Alternate realities and parallel universes, which, of course, tie into some of the other theories. Quantum erasure. And the final contender on the list, which seems to have as much of a horse in this race as any of the others, is... Satan. Okay. Let's bring it home now with the final possible cause for the Mandela effect. And this is not up for debate. We are learning it all here and going to give this one a fair shake. Rob Shelsky be damned. False memory and confabulation. You guys remember not that long ago when I used the example of the telephone game to prove my very paranormal point on the Hat Man and Slender Man? I thought it was pretty clever. Hope you did, too. Anyway, so, yeah, um, I'm about to use it in order to support this very unparanormal idea that false memory is the cause of the Mandela effect. Because it turns out, your memory, the way you recall things, is a lot like the telephone game. Donna Bridge, a postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University and lead author of the paper on a false memory study recently published in the Journal of Neuroscience, stated... A memory is not simply an image produced by time traveling back to the original event. It can be an image that is somewhat distorted because of the prior times you remembered it. Your memory of an event can grow less precise, even to the point of being totally false with each retrieval. It's a little more well-known today than it was even just a few years ago that when you are remembering an original event— you're not actually remembering said original event. You are remembering the last time you remembered it. Why? Because memories aren't static. They are always adapting based on new information, the way we feel when we are having the memory, if we're in a new environment, a different time of day. These types of variants can contribute to the way we recall an event. Depending on the variants, your brain might integrate that new information. Memory mistakes are quite common, which is why eyewitness testimony can be considered very unreliable. Though the witness can seem and feel extremely confident that their memory is accurate, 
It is the very malleability of both memory and visual perception that makes eyewitness testimony one of the most unreliable forms of evidence and has been attributed to many wrongful convictions. Now, confabulation is basically a type of lying. However, it is linked to many memory disorders because even though it is a partial or complete fabrication of a memory, the person retelling the memory actually has no idea that the memory is false. They aren't intentionally being deceptive and sincerely aren't aware that they are lying or misremembering. Confabulation can range from very small distortions of actual memories to the creation of completely false memories, but they can often include elaborate detail. While this bizarre occurrence is often linked to memory disorders like dementia, like Alzheimer's, it can impact non-impaired people too. And according to the article Confabulation, a Guide for Mental Health Professionals, even when the client is presented with information that directly conflicts with their version of events, they will persist in believing their memories are wholly accurate. So, look, this can happen to me. This can happen to you. It's territory that comes with having a human brain. Period. Full stop. So, what are we to do here? How do we decipher a created memory from what really happened? How can we tell our confabulation from reality? First, let's understand there are two types, provoked and spontaneous confabulation. Provoked is when someone creates a false memory in response to a direct question. This one is most common and most often seen in patients with dementia or Alzheimer's. Spontaneous is when someone tells their false story on the spot without any obvious reason to do so. Based on this information, we can assume that spontaneous confabulation is what can most often be observed in people with no known neurological conditions or memory disorders, us regular folk. So, let's say you want to figure out whether you are spontaneously confabulating, and if so, figure out how to stop it. That seems like it would be far easier than continue fighting with every internet troll over whether the line was, if you build it, they will come, versus if you build it, he will come or the great Flintstone flint stone debate? Okay, what do we do if we sincerely want to examine whether our memory is false or not? Well, it just so happens I have a handy dandy wiki how list of five things you can do for just this purpose. Number one, understand and recognize that our brains do not always store information correctly think we've talked about this if you are a coherent, somewhat intelligent human being with the capability to step outside of your own head and bias and be objective, you can do this easy enough. Number two, ask yourself how confident you are that your recollection is correct. I spoke on my own ability to recognize my own false memories before because of the fact that the memory I had maybe wasn't all that clear, or there were pieces missing, or it was fuzzy. So if you're like me, you can do this. No sweat. Moving on. Number three. Does the memory you hold contain sensory details? Researchers have found that real memories will often have more details, but especially sensory ones. If the grilled cheese burned the roof of your mouth, or the speakers were still turned to max from the night before so you blasted your ears off when you started the engine, if the garbage outside your window smelled especially bad that morning because it was blisteringly hot already and you were late for work so your heartbeat was racing with your anxiety and you couldn't decide if you had enough time to both take a shower and move the garbage can further away from the window, it stank so bad you still chose the shower but a cold one because it felt extra nice pelting your especially warm, sweaty skin. You know, those kinds of details. Number four, compare what you remember to independent evidence. No, not that photo of you tagged at the Statue of Liberty that isn't there. No, not that scene in Coneheads, Beldar, phone home, phone home, not that either. You know, like, uh, like something that disproves what you remember. Definitely not the souvenir stuffy from Disneyland you got as a kid with Mickey Mouse wearing suspenders or your journal entry from 1983 when you discussed the sad passing of Nelson Mandela. Not those either. Make me proud. And if you were able to get through these and are still confident that your memory is correct. Number five. 
talk with others who may have witnessed or experienced said event, just not the thousands of others who experienced it the same exact way. Okay? Jesus Christ. I need an aspirin to do this show. So, there you have it. Some highlighted possible causes and theories on the Mandela effect. Hope you hung in there with me. That was a lot. I know. You're doing good, kid. That's a wrap for today, you crazy lot. Hope you enjoyed learning some of the more common theories of what causes this phenomenon. It gets murky real quick, I know. But if you stuck with me and are actually still looking forward to more, I feel you are a person, sound of mind, ready to set your bias aside for the sake of learning this subject inside and out in order to make a well-informed decision for yourself by the end, whether this Mandela Effect business is real or just cap. BS, nonsense, teach ain't playing, and good news, there is more coming. Did any of the theories or causes I discussed today really spark your imagination? Or did you hope I'd be discussing any of the others at length? Let's discuss it over on the socials. I'm curious what you think and down for a conversation. Find me at at ParanormGirlPod on any of the platforms or email me at ParanormGirlPod at gmail.com. Before we wrap it up for today, briefly, I wanted to holla at Ryan and Jordan over on the Campfire Tales podcast. They gave this show a really cool and very unexpected shout out over on their Instagram story recently. If you do not yet know about these guys or their show, I'm going to plug them right now so that you do. The full title is Campfire Tales of the Strange and Unsettling. They cover a different spooky, scary, strange, and definitely unsettling story at the top of their episodes, and then take the time to pull it apart, dissect, examine, and discuss the different aspects of the tale. I've added them to my growing list of paranormal podcasts, and you should too. All right, lesson completed, plugs inserted. Why did I just say it that way? Moving on. And now, for your final note. You know, 15 episodes in doesn't sound like a whole lot, but I've been doing this show since March, and that's a pretty good chunk of time. I've learned so damn much already. I sincerely hope this has reached those of you out there who needed this as much as I did. And if you have learned anything new that you didn't know before listening, I consider that mission accomplished. And also, same here. It's occurred to me that I've really gotten sucked into this M.E. world. It kind of works that way when you immerse yourself and commit your focus to any topic, right? And it's fun and something different to itch your brain in these ways, imagining that, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe we're in a simulation. Maybe CERN is to blame. Maybe, oh, maybe it was and has been Satan all this time after all. But I had a realization for myself recently that has kind of rocked me hard. A question, really. How far is too far? As in, where is the point of no return with this stuff? I find the personal accounts and stories I read and receive the most fascinating. There are details to them that make the entire story seem irreproachable, you know? Like, one recounted memory is like a little dive down a microscope so we can look at the slice of this phenomenon between the plates. And then, you see that there are others. More than just a few. And it's incredibly convincing. Yet still, I fear, contributing to the disinformation that runs rampant these days. I fear that even just mentioning on here, even to prove my point... A quote from a scientist, an excerpt from an expert's book, that just putting it out there will warp someone's own idea of the world. Even though it's only meant to educate, to teach you more. So I may often reel it back in. Where do I reel it all into? Our base reality. Look around you. Feel the floor beneath your feet, the cat on your lap. This... This is where we always need to return, to ground ourselves, to bring our minds back to quiet, back to the beginning. Because, honestly, only when you have that stasis, that control in this experiment, do you have the ability to actually see the differences, and if there are any even. 
Because if we can't clear our minds of the confirmation bias and look around and agree that this reality that surrounds us, the thing that the majority of people agree is in fact reality, is real, well, that's when we start slurping ivermectin smoothies and mainline and bleach, folks. And I sincerely don't wish to contribute to that. So, here's your and my reeling back in. Listen to these episodes, smile, nod, agree even, and then turn it off and go about your day. Hug your kids, play with the dog, enjoy that pumpkin spice latte, take that internship, and call your mother once in a while, for Christ's sake. Enjoy your life and find ways to embrace this thing we call our reality. Because as exciting as any alternative can possibly be, this is what we currently have to work with until we know better. And this can be something really special and incredible sometimes. And all of this is not to say you can't believe in the extraordinary, the paranormal. Hey, hey, truth is often stranger than fiction. There are some unexplainable things out there. I know that to be true. But I guess I'm just saying, have a safe place to return to when it gets to be too much. I think if you can balance a sense of reality and an openness to the unexplainable equally... Well, that definitely makes you a skeptical believer. And more and more, I'm thinking that that may be the perfect way to be. Knowing that both the cold beer in your hand is real, but that the picture of the Statue of Liberty clearly on Ellis Island could possibly be real as well, with enough evidence to support it. To be that type of person in itself is unique and magical. You damn unicorn you. Now, if you'll excuse me, my alien overlords at CERN are absolutely blowing up my phone. I supposedly have to shut down now for my update. So, until next time, stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.